I think we're good. <laughs> Lord help us. Well, thanks everyone for being patient and waiting for us. Um, we had some technical difficulties. The great thing about technology is it brings us all together. The bad thing about it is it drives us nuts sometimes. Uh, special thanks to Jonathan Rowe for walking me through that harrowing experience. I feel like I need a stiff drink now. <laughs> we we were just we were just saying just before we started when we realized that it was going off the rails we had a similar thing exactly happened to this uh, Monday Thursday five minutes before the service uh, service started and it's it's grueling it's awful yeah bad on the old blood pressure but you survived it's all good I did, I did. Um, so uh, yeah so tonight we are in the second of our open table conversations. And I just wanted to say very quickly, just a word about the Open Table Collective, which is the kind of the host group uh, for this project. Um, so we, we, we've, we, we found that we needed a, a venue and, a, you know, a community where we could come together as, you know, people who, some of us are leaders in church communities, faith communities, some of us are just uh, participants in faith communities, but a way where we could come together and you know support each other, encourage each other, challenge each other, uh, learn from each other. And so we started this project way back before the pandemic was you know even in anybody's mind. And uh, when the pandemic hit, we kind of thought, well, maybe we could shift this community to an online community. And so uh, that's what we did. And so we're trying to find ways to bring people together in conversation about issues that matter to uh, people of faith uh, or people of no faith or little faith or questioning faith or whatever your faith might be. And uh, so that's the rationale behind the Open Table Collective and then the Open Table Conversations. And so we did a, a conversation just only a few weeks ago about church in the digital age, and we realized we only just scratched the surface. There is a lot more to talk about. And so we decided we were going to do some more conversations, and that brings us to tonight's topic, which is uh, community and hospitality. Now, we're going to talk about that in the big picture uh, view of community and hospitality, but also focus in a little bit on the challenges that have arisen uh, from the pandemic uh, and also from um, digital media itself. Uh, how do you create community with people when you're not in the same room together, which has been the model of church for the last, what, 2000 years? So it's kind of hard to shake that uh, model. So that's the conversation that we're going to be having tonight. And so we have a wonderful panel of people who have uh, willingly given of their time because they're passionate about this kind of stuff and passionate about people and passionate about community to be here and talk with us. Uh, you probably already have seen um, the introductions that we did on our page. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time going into that just to go around real quick. We've got Paula Gale. Uh, from New World Island. We've got Jonathan Rowe with us from St. Michael and All Angels. We've got Ann Walsh with us, and she's a part of the Redemptorist Order. We've got Liz Ole, and she's part of the Quaker community here in St. John's, but also part of the Out in Faith community. And then we've got Steve Grimes, who is from the Mosaic University Chapel, and also a Pentecostal chaplain at Memorial University. So great group. I'm so excited. Uh, to have all these uh, people here with me. So my, my first uh, question really, and we'll take some time here to just go around so everybody can have a couple of minutes to just take a swing at this question. And then after that subsequent questions will kind of be a free for all. And I am gonna be watching the, uh, the live stream feed there if there's any questions that come from people who are watching. Uh, but the first question is really just a general kind of introduction for everybody. So. What, what does community mean to you? Uh, and maybe we can start with Paula. So when you think about community, what, what comes to mind? Um, 
gathering together with those who share um, something, and in this case, obviously, uh, it would be our shared faith and, and uh, in the role I play as minister um, of a community of faith. Um, and, um, and those who have a shared passion for, for whatever that may be. Uh, and again, in our case, that would be um, the gospel of Christ uh, and, um, and for one another and how we're called um, to be there um, for one another and to be the body of Christ. Um, and so community, maybe if you had asked me this in the first week of March, I would have named you know, the gathered worshiping community in our space and also those, you know, under my pastoral care who are not out necessarily to worship or to events and those things, but who fall under my pastoral care. Um, community has been redefined for us very quickly. Um, and because now, as I thought of that, I didn't just think of those who gather in our physical space when we gather. And I didn't just think of all the names that are on my pastoral care list. Uh, all of a sudden, it's the people who have become part of our Sunday worship, um, the people who have even joined some of our midweek groups because they've gone online, and they're not right here living on New World Island. And in either one of the communities, because I have people come from about 14 or 15 communities that I'm responsible for, because we're an amalgamated congregation. So if you want to talk amalgamation, you can have me back another night for that uh, conversation. But, um, and so for me, just the definition of that has changed uh, just in the last um, couple of months. Um, but I, I would say um, a shared passion and a shared interest. And, uh, and again, um, that would be um, living out the gospel of Christ in the world. Thank you, Paula. Just uh, a word to people who maybe just joining us. Yes, we're a little bit late getting going. If you're just getting to us now, we had some technical difficulty. So we're about uh, 25 minutes behind schedule, but you're, 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 you haven't missed hardly anything if you're just joining us. So thanks for finding us and, and tuning in. So I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan now. And we're, we're dealing with the introductory question, really, which is just, you know, uh, to get us going here, which is what does community mean to you? Community, and I'm, I'm glad that while Paula was talking, I had a chance to, uh, to get this clear in my head. Thanks, Paula, for, <laughs> for taking one for the team and, and, and giving us all a chance to think. And I'll blather, I'll blather for a second now to give uh, uh, whoever's next a chance to, uh, to think a little bit more. I think that for me, community is about when a group of people recognize that the thing that they have in common is more important than the things that separate them. Um, so... So for example, this evening, we all have a passion around the church in the dig digital age. And so the fact that we have wildly different perspectives on any number of other things, we can, we can put all that to one side. We can actually come to appreciate those, uh, appreciate those differences and see them in a, in, in a different light now because of, the things that we, because of the things that we share. And we say that I'm going, to, I'm going to recognize that the things that hold us together are far more important to me, at least in this context. Than the things that uh, uh, than the things that separate us, and so community can be community can be shifting sand sometimes. But it's uh, but but hopefully, if you know if if we are building a, a community on our faith and on the rock that's Jesus Christ, that you know that works for me. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just for the people who are listening to, um, we're trying to make this as interactive as possible. So as we're going through this and saying what we think uh, community is. We would love to hear from you what you think community is. So please feel free to post in the comments uh, what community is for you, why it's important, uh, maybe what community you're a part of. It, it may be a religious community. It might not be a religious community, but we would love to hear from you and, and, and your experiences. Mm -hmm. So next we're gonna go to Ann Walsh. Ann, what is community to you? Good question. I think, uh, Rob, for me, the, the, like I think a few other people have already said, my sense of it has changed a little with the whole um, onslaught of what we've been able to do and what we've been struggling with and trying to build with the, the pandemic and in particular around the, the lockdown issues around pandemic. But to me, it's there's two roots. I mean, there's common and unity. So for me, community is 
a, a group of people gathered around what the conviction that Jonathan's already talked about, that what we hold as uh, we're, what unites us is much more important than what divides or separates us and what we don't hold in common. And then there's the aspect of unity. And so uh, what's kind of fascinating to me in all of this is that uh, two and a half months ago, I might have said it's a group of people that come together to worship. And now I'd say it's a group of people who come together, but it doesn't have to be in the same building. And uh, so we've, we've had we've thrown around these sayings for the last little while that, you know, the church is is deployed. It's not it's not dispersed, it's deployed. And I, I, I believe that more than ever with all of this. So common and unity are the two hinge words that I'm going to hang on there. And that that can be built and not necessarily in the same building. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll get into this as we go tonight, but community is not all about, you know, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. It's messy and dirty. and Yeah, I, <laughs> I think anybody who's lived in a family knows something yeah. about the messiness and the dirtiness of, of community that it's, in fact, it's love is built in the hard times and, and the common is built. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't just come into being magically. It takes working through particularly hard times together. And that doesn't have to be, again, in the same room. And we know that already, not, not even thinking about church terms, in families, in families of Newfoundlanders who've been spread across the globe, as technology has developed, we've discovered that we can build and create family and family unity and work through hard times through digital means. I, you know, I've looked at grandparents dealing with grandkids in, in Grand Prairie, a lot of grands in there, <laughs> but, but that, that, that we can do this at distance is not new to us. It's new to us in church. And that's fascinating to me. So I think we're actually learning or taking some of the learnings that we've been building over the past number of years as families and saying, how does this apply to us now in that other family that we're part of? Hmm. Great point. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, Liz, what do you think? When I think of community, I think of um, people having a sense of belonging and a sense of acceptance and a sense of care. The, I think of connection amongst us. I think that all of us as humans probably belong to a number of different communities in our lives. And each of those communities would meet different needs. And I think that people that come to a spiritual community aren't all coming with the same needs for it. And so I think that to me, community is best when it accepts people's individuality and uniqueness and can at least try to recognize people's different needs, though it's probably unlikely to be able to meet all of those. So those are things that come to mind for me. Yeah, there's really, you know, our, we don't really have one community, do we? We're, as individuals, we're part of probably what's better termed networked communities, right? We're part of different groups of, of belonging. So there's no one group really that can, you know, meet all the needs like, you, like you're saying. And the other thing too, I think that's really important for us to acknowledge in this conversation is that uh, and this is a big shift for us in, in the church and in, in religious communities is that we don't have a monopoly on community, right? It used to be a generation or two ago that the church was one of the few, um, you know, possibilities that people had for community. That's definitely not the case anymore. So we need to acknowledge that you know we're not the only game in town and in fact sometimes we suck at community <laughs> we could we could learn from you know those outside of, of you know religious and faith communities 
we can learn from them on how to be a, a better and more welcoming community. Steve Grimes, what do you think? Uh, when I think of community, I think of the thing or group or um, organization that you lean on when you find yourself alone. Um, but I, I got just for example, as soon as this pandemic hit, um, I found a lot of the students in our church were relying on the community of their small groups to kind of ask questions and talk about their fears of what was happening around them. And, and so their first reaction was to go to that group of people. And so when I think of community, I think it's um, the, the core people that you surround yourself with that um, you really rely on in some of the loneliest and fearful moments that you have in your life. Um, not just the moments where you have fun and um, party and all those things, right? It's the moments where like when, when life gets tough and it sucks, like who's the people that you text? Who's the people that you reach out to? Um, and to me, that's kind of like what genuine community represents. So, Yeah, and that could depend on the thing that you're facing, right? Because sometimes yeah. it's something and and the community you reach out to is 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 family, like the people, you know, that you're related to or, you know, raised you. Sometimes it's it's friends, sometimes people from your from your church. Uh, I mean, circumstances um, you know, determine who who you reach out to. And it just I think it's again, it speaks to the the plethora of communities that we're a part of and how different situations and circumstances call us to draw on particular communities, right? We're, we're never just, uh, there's never just one community that does everything for us. Maybe if there was, we might call that a cult, right? Isn't that, isn't that what a cult tries to do? Be everything, right? So, I mean, part of the conversation is acknowledging that we're a part of these multifaceted communities and, you know, networked communities. Great stuff. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Uh, did we get anything from online? Michelle Eagle says community is a recognition of a connecting force and a willingness to explore that with others. Thank you, Michelle, for that. So now kind of in just a, a free for all now, whoever wants to jump in, give me some examples of, of community and some, some examples of hospitality, uh, either from like places where you're involved now or, or some kind of community or act of hospitality that's been really formative on you, that really uh, formed and shaped your understanding of community and hospitality today. I'd have to say, you know, that that uh, perhaps uh, if Tony Bidgood is listening to this, he's going to laugh at me because I'm going to talk about the mythical community. But I taught in, in a community in Bonavista Bay for seven years, and I would say that they ruined me in the best possible sense of the word. Uh, a friend of mine who was a missionary in Mexico always said the poor ruined her. And I think that the people in this town ruined me. They changed my whole perspective on things. And it wasn't that life was easy. I think the way community is built is yes, by celebrating the good times, but it really working through the hard times. So working through a rape, working through situations of adult illiteracy and how can we together find a way to, to address that, um, to look at you know, fractures in families and, and not to say we're gonna make that better. How do we deal with it creatively and love one another through it? So for me, what, what, I, what they taught me there, they totally destroyed a lot of things I had believed beforehand, idealistically, and helped me to become a much better listener and a much better member of a community. What we built together was realistic. And I think that's the, one of the key things for me now about community is that it's not this idealistic pie in the sky thing. It's, it's, um, it's realistic. It's, it's dealing, yes, celebrating the good, but also helping one another to, to live creatively, heal, or find better solutions to the, the hard stuff life throws at us. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Yeah, good. Anybody else? Some examples of community or maybe even some things that are going on in your life right now that are just really your good examples of community and hospitality that you're really proud of and you just want to talk about. 
Well, I think something that I was proud about of St. John's and the Eastern Avalon um, happened with Snowmageddon. I think a lot of us came through that so proud of where we live. And it was tough. It was really tough. Now, what we're going through now makes that just seem like training wheels. But it was um, a time where in so many arenas, people came forward to help neighbors, to build giant networks of getting food to people, of making sure that people weren't left out, that people were taken care of. And, and, and some of those groups have, have carried on and continued into this COVID time. And I think that feeling pride in one's community is something that, um, and it's coming through that hardship uh, together, like you said, Anne, and that it's um, when we do it well, that sense of pride is one of those deeply meaningful uh, kumbaya moments, you know, and I, I think that it makes us more connected to one another. Yeah, the example that I would give of, of community comes from my faith community here at St. Mark's, but an experience, uh, a personal experience, a couple of years ago, uh, my dad died by suicide. And so we were left as a family, you know, picking up the pieces of that. But, and so for a few months, I, I was not in a good place. <laughs> And, but you know what got me through it was the was the notion that my faith community was praying for me and supporting me. Now I'm not the type of person that's into like touchy feely, you know, praying. We'll all agree together, and then God's going to do whatever we want God to do. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. But just the thought that there was a whole group of people who were thinking about me cheering me on, wishing me well, sending me positive vibes, whatever it was, I could feel that. I could literally feel that lifting me through that horrible time. To me, that's one of the most powerful examples of community that I've ever experienced in my life, right? It got me through that time. And it was that community that, that did that for me. Yeah, I, th I think sometimes we can overcomplicate um, creating community spaces or hospitality initiatives. Like, uh, like realistically, all it takes is a group of people to not be so consumed with themselves <laughs> and, and to care about others. And maybe it's a simple prayer or um, dropping off groceries to somebody who needs it or just like there's nothing any more complicated than it has to be than that, right? So yeah, I think if we just kind of got back to the basics of, hey, let's just be genuine, loving human beings and keep our eyes open to how we can be there for somebody. And that helps kickstart community, I think. Yeah. I mean, this could be something that will, will come up in because one of the things I've, one of the questions there is around challenges to community. And I think sometimes in the church, one of the challenges to community is that we want to treat it like a program, mm. Right what what program can we run what you know uh class can we offer what thing can we do what steps can we follow to to build community or to attract people into community i don't know I don't and know. in my denomination you got to appoint a committee to take care of that too, so. <laughs> yeah. definitely I was going to say, I was going to say that, I mean, I think that, and this is, you know, it, it's still kind of a half-baked idea in my head. Um, so argue with me over this if it, you know, if we need to. I mean, I think that, I think that community needs to have a certain amount of leisure that's built in. We say, we, we talk an awful lot of talk about, you know, when you come together, you're, you know, working on a project together and the, the act of working with people. Or the active, you know, I mean, having a meal together is, you know, these these are things that we do that we build that, that we build community. But if we don't have the opportunity to just sort of, in the mid in the middle of a Habitat for Humanity build or whatever is you know is going on, that point where we stop, we you know, you just sit down for a minute, you have a drink of water, and you talk to the person next to you, and community is kind of built in uh, built in that. I 
I always worry about when, you know, when in the church we start talking about we got to make more opportunities for fellowship. It really worries me when I hear that because because I know that next thing, next thing, you know, someone's going to start using fellowship like a verb, like we need a fellowship now this afternoon. Um, and, and that to me, it always feels it always feels so contrived. It feels like uh, it feels like the point where mom and dad say we're going to have some family together time now. Uh, we're going to have quality time as a family and best of intentions. But the thing is that the, the quality time as a family is something that you recognize. It's not something that, that you set out to make. Um, it comes a point and, you know, and fellowship is, you know, fellowship in the church is the same thing, the same thing as well. It's almost like a, you know, it's almost like a side product of what, you know, of, of what happens when you let your guard down and you stop, you, know, you stop trying to overcomplicate it. Collegiality amongst the clergy is the same, you know, uh, the same thing exactly. We get far more done um, in, in organic ways than, uh, than contrived forced things. Yeah, it's like icebreakers at a, at a conference or something, right? <laughs> I used to know a, a friend of mine was, was famous for saying, you're, you're going to do this now and you will have fun. Yeah. You know, like legislating fun. Often when, when I sometimes get to teach group facilitation courses and segments of courses, and you always say, look, there's two things that have to go together here. One of them is as a leader, you have um, a, a, response, a task function. You, you're, you're charged with helping a group get to getting the work done. But you also have a maintenance function for want of a better term. And it's let's get to that goal, but let's still like each other. Mm. <laughs> you know, and all too often community is built at the price of individuals. You know, we, we think somehow or other that um, we can get to that spot and 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 kind of cast people aside along the way. So I think it's really important to to keep in 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 uppermost in our minds as leaders, especially that part of our job as leaders is to help people to realize that they have worth, that that uh, they're important, that they have value, that and that all of us have those has have dignity and and uh, bring joy to this whole thing. So I just, uh, sometimes we lose, I lose sight of that sometimes in the, the mad, like, let's get this done thing. Yeah. I, I couldn't help but think when Jonathan was talking there, I was thinking about a, a quote that I've heard him say many times, Jerry Witte would say, um, when talking about community and these kinds of things, you know, he would say, you know, we need to loiter with intent, right? Just hanging around just lounging in each other's presence when you think and when you think about the gospels i mean jesus was a master at that like just you know hanging around you know reclining that table uh you know out you know just in the country with his disciples wherever like he was a master at at that building that kind of community and, and you know you, you think about your own family growing up like you didn't really have committee meetings <laughs> how we're gonna you know bond as a family you didn't have a like a, a dry run of christmas morning to say okay now everybody get your places and or when you sit around the table for for dinner you don't you know it's not so rehearsed you just it happens by doing right and, and, I, and, and if I can, when I mentioned the amalgamation piece for this faith family here, um, 25 years ago, seven little churches in little nooks and crannies around, you know, this island that on their own were not going to make it and decided to come together, built a new building and, and it's a success story. Um, it was not contrived. It was not, it didn't come down from above and say you have to close out your buildings and come together. The people in conversation together decided they needed to do something. And I came six years after they had gotten together and built the new building and moved in together. Um, and I saw that community was built. I said to them many times, you know, it was at the sink in the kitchen at the church, right? The people standing side by side who lived in communities on opposite ends of the island that didn't know the other, <laughs> you know, because it was only 10 minutes by car, but before that it was three hours by boat to get there and they, they didn't know. And so it was with their arms, you know, up to their elbows and dishpan water was where 
church community was built um, and, and they did a lovely job of that, but nobody set out to say, we're going to get together and we're going to love each other. And this is the 10 step, how we're going to do that. Um, it happened in a very organic way. And so it's a wonderful example of how, as Jonathan was, you know, we can't, I'm always panicky, you know, when we say, okay, you know, clergy in a certain cluster in a certain ge geography, you're going to, you're going to get together and be support to one another and all that. So, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> thanks but i'll i'll find my own people you know um and so same thing right and, and you know you hear stories of where denominations close out buildings and churches and tell people you had to get together and do and it flops and and nothing happens because again those things have to happen very organically and and i'm i'm i can see that example before me and the people i minister to all the time so one yeah. thing that comes to mind to me i guess i tried to say it a little bit to begin with is that people come with different needs and they also come with different gifts to bring that um, for some people that sense of downtime or unstructured time is terrifying people that don't feel comfortable in groups people that have certain amounts of anxiety about being with people they don't know well perhaps and um, people that feel more introverted and, and need some of those um, structures, not necessarily contrived icebreakers, but more like that, go wash those dishes together. You know, something that gives you a focus that's not just, well, let's chat with the people next to you. Um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that people do come with, with different needs and different gifts. Um, some people, what they can offer is being the, um, the one that's going to grab the ball and say, come on, everybody, let's go play. And someone else is going to be the one who can organize the various tasks that need to be done and um so to to just stay open that not one situation is going to speak to everybody yeah liz i'm really glad you brought that up because that's a good reminder for me personally because i'm an extrovert mm -hmm. and so in some sense, you know, community within a group is easy for me, right? I thrive off of it. And the pandemic is killing me because I can't be around people, groups of people. That's how I get my energy. Not everybody's like that. For some people, community, especially, especially community in, in bigger groups is really hard. And I'm guilty sometimes of thinking it's really easy. Let's throw everybody in the same room and magically community will happen <laughs> doesn't happen like that either does it right so Half the people are going to be you know running off to say they have to go to the wet restroom because they're freaked out yeah so on the one hand you can't you, it can't be too fabricated it can't be too manufactured but neither can it be so kind of loosey goosey you know ambiguous nebulous that you think it's just going to happen if you can get people in the same room right so it's this kind of really you know intangible kind of thing this community that we're talking about right it's but you know rob it really uh, for what you're saying now to me highlights a real gift that we're given in this current time you know, if we have to think about how do we build community digitally or virtually, really, we have a chance to actually ask those questions overtly to one another. Like if we're going to have an online scripture study group, or if we're going to have an online centering prayer group, or if we're going to have a workshop online or a reflection activity, how are we going to build in those things that draw out the best response or the, the, the optimal response from the most people? So rather than do what we always did before, this really gives a chance to consciously build in how are we going to encourage and build and grow community in this new platform? 
it's not a room in in the in a ver you know in, a, in a, a concrete sense but it gives us uh, like a fresh start in a way to yeah. say what it was what have we learned about building community in our in our rooms that now we can bring to this new platform i think it, it, what you're highlighting is the, a real gift that we're being offered to how do we get the, the most response how do we encourage people to really participate in this new medium yeah just to read a comment that someone just posted it's from diana deacon she says and you and you can't measure how engaged people are in a community by the same yardstick for everyone that's a really good point right because the extrovert is going to be buzzing around the room and really into it or faking that they're into it sometimes to be completely honest but uh, not everybody is like that, right? So the person who is more of an introvert or has some social anxiety, you can't really gauge the same way, right? I, I, I agree with what you're saying. I'm going to say, you know, as, you know, I'm going to be the introvert to your extrovert. Uh, and I'm going to say that I have never, you know, I have never, personally, I have never held back from commenting, joining online communities, Facebook groups, and, uh, and things like that. Part of it is, and I don't think that it has, I don't think that it's about the introversion, extroversion thing. In some ways, I feel a little bit more liberated with strangers because, you know, I don't know them. I can argue with them in a, you know, in a, in a completely different way. And if someone, you know, if someone disagrees with me, as long as I never have to see him again, what do I care? It's not, you know, that <laughs> there's, you know, there, 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 there's not an issue there. I, I remember reading um, years and years back, I remember reading about like in, in any kind of online community, whether it's going to be um, people who are part of a Facebook group, whether it's going to be uh, commenters on a blog, you're going to have like out of every hundred, you know, out, out of every hundred blog readers, you're going to have about 10 people are going to be commenting. The other 90 are just, you know, that, that's, they're just there to read. They're completely there to, you know, to consume. And of those 10, you're going to have one who is going to like comment on every single friggin' thing that you, you know, that you have to say for good or for real. That's, you know, that's just kind of how, that's just kind of and, and I've, I've carried that with me like these last 15 years or something um just that just that awareness that for every person who is commenting there's probably about nine more people who are uh, who are taking it all in and i say that as someone who i'm, I'm going to be that one guy who's probably going to comment on you know just about uh, just about everything and i know people who are far more extroverted than i am who are they're not going to make that uh, um, they're, they're, they're not going to make those comments. And even when I've tried to sort of draw them out and I say, this person knows about this, you should, you know, and I tag them in a post and try and, no, it's not going to happen. And that's, you know, and, and, and that's okay. That's, you know, it's just different people in their different comfort levels. And, and uh, yeah, the, the, the yardstick thing, you can't, you can't measure it the same way. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, maybe like, I uh, thank Anne for bringing up that point about, you know, the, the opportunity now as we you know turn into a, a different way of, of being community to have the opportunity to to be intentional about you know how we form those communities you know as i said in the description of the event you know it feels like in the west in particular we are in the midst of this like cultural quest for community um where you're hearing language like there is uh, an epidemic of loneliness. I remember reading, I think it was in the UK somewhere, and I think there's some kind of government agency now that deals just with loneliness, and in particular amongst seniors. And I remember another report where I was reading about, you know, loneliness amongst millennials. And there was some god awful percentage of millennials who say they have no friends. Like they go to work, they go to school maybe associate with some people, they go home, nobody. So there's this like, you know, crisis of community going on. But at the same time, people aren't seeking out faith communities to, to fill that void. We're, we're all well aware of the decline um, that traditional churches are experiencing. And I would say all churches now are experiencing that same kind of decline. So... What, what, are the, what are the challenges, or maybe we could start with the opportunities, but what are the challenges or opportunities that we, we face, in particular as we shift to a more digital world? 
right? And I would encourage people who are, who are watching too, what do you see are the challenges and the opportunities as we enter into more and more of a digital world, right? We said the last time we had a conversation, this digital thing, this is nothing new, right? It's just that we in, in the church and in faith communities now are finally, because we were forced to, waking up to the necessity that, that this is a thing. But for more and more people, they're, they're living more and more of their lives digitally, right? So what are the challenges and the opportunities that we face in this particular time when it comes to uh, creating community and especially hospitality? How the hell do you do hospitality digitally? Well, one thing's for sure, uh, and only one thing, uh, it's that hospitality is not about your home. I, I, uh, being a Newfoundlander, I always thought it was about my kitchen. You know, that it was about bringing you into my kitchen, giving you tea or whatever it was you wanted and something to eat. And hospitality was welcoming you into my space. And one thing that this whole experience has taught me, although I think I've been thinking about it for a long time, is that hospitality really at its core is generosity. Like if, if it's not about my kitchen and you come into my kitchen anymore, or you come into my church or you come into my group, you know, my space, uh, it's not about welcoming you into a physical space. It's welcoming. So really it's at its core, it's can I be generous enough to create a virtual space where you are welcome? And what does that mean? That everybody is welcome. You know, so, and, and if I don't have that attitude, I'll never have a, a building or a community that can do it. So that's one thing that's really hitting me about hospitality and all this is at its core, it's not about a place. It's really about generosity. And can I, we be generous enough to get out of the way and welcome people in no matter what? And I was going to say, and the same thing, it, it's about welcome for me. And as much as we enjoy having the cups of tea and those things when we're together, that we're, we're still managing to and have expanded the table, right? Because of how we are. And, you know, when I look on Sundays in a Facebook live worship and see, you know, people from literally around the world and who have connections to us and who know are able to join. But there's also the person who lives two minutes from the church who has never been out to physical worship, but who's the first person to sign in online. And why, why is that, <laughs> right? So somehow, you know, I have friends who are physically differently abled of all, you know, ages of life who've said this is the most welcoming time they've found church to be. <laughs> Had the same experience because, with people with mental illness. Exactly. And that, and that right? that all of a sudden the barriers are down in ways that, you know, they didn't have to worry if there was a, a ramp in the building or if there was, you know, right. And so they're able to join in in a way that we never thought about how, right, how this welcome and how it's easier to be hospitable in many ways, right. And has opened up um, group activities and so on, you know, for people who've chosen to come to things online who I never would have had show up to something that I offered in physical, you know, in person, right? And so, wow, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> right? That is absolutely wonderful, right? Um, you know, yeah. it's it's funny and maybe, not ha ha funny, but maybe like ironic funny <laughs> that, um, you know, the major claim and probably the, you know, what it offers to us in, you know, digital technology is is connection right so but isn't it ironic that with you know the extreme advances that we've made in digital technology in just the last 10 years has also coincided with this huge rise in people feeling this absence of community in their lives right because one of the challenges with digital technology is I guess every technology has this built in, but there's a there's an inherent uh, privilege to it, right? Um, and those of us who are privileged, because we're all privileged enough to have some kind of electronic device and some connection to the internet, where we could gather here like this tonight, and everybody who's listening to us is is you know viewing as well. 
But, you know, Rosalind Bartlett brings up a point here. She says, not everyone feels comfortable or has the technology to join community online. So I'd like to hear some thoughts from people here. How, how do we address that? How do we, in our attempt, because I, I agree with the things that Paul have said and that Anne have said about, you know, the, the opportunity of technology to draw the circle wider, to include more people. How do we, how do we address this, this idea of the limitations of, of, of technology that, that often excludes or can exclude people? What, what, what do you say about that? And it's my biggest yeah. fear in the midst of this because I feel like I am leaving behind. You know, I have a number of people who are not connected. So, you know, on Sundays, it's call up a neighbor who's not online and at least hold the speaker of your telephone out to your computer speaker, you know. So always trying to think of how, because I would never want us to leave behind a whole group of people, right, and to alienate. So thanks to Rosalind for raising that point because it's a major concern, a major concern. But, you know, I, I look at the, the whole thing with the school systems right now and I um, actually called NTV News a week and a half ago and said, like, I really appreciate you wanting uh, Janice Fitzgerald or John Hagee to tell the future, but they can't. Like, I, I got so mad about this, you know, asking them, like, what's going to happen in a week and how do they know that? The real story here is the, the, the inequity, the, the rich and poor that this has exposed, this whole scenario where kids don't have either don't have access to the internet literally don't have the equipment don't have wi-fi there's they're in an abusive situation there's more than one kid and only one computer i think what what this really has done for us this whole digital explosion that we've been involved in for the last two months it has exposed the inequities in our society and it's really brought into sharp focus the rich the, the divide between rich and poor so rob you were asking what can we do like instead of a food drive sometime let's have an ipad drive <laughs> let's do let's do something that gets people connected who want to be connected at least or offer the invitation but there's there's a real inequity emerging here that's that is disturbing to me anyway well and it's not just the the hardware yeah you know, there's the ongoing monthly fees that go with servicing that device. And so, I mean, Quakers are a bit different in a number of ways. I mean, we don't have a physical space here in St. John's. And some people have found it much easier to be part of our um, meeting for worship because some of the reasons you've mentioned, either um, using a wheelchair or mobility issues, but also people that have children. Mute is a wonderful uh, device, you know, for all kinds of things, being able to go on in people's lives while they take in what they can and for, for single parents who, can't and I've been part of um, Quaker meetings where I used to live and the parents and the kids sit there together on the couch and the kids leave when they're ready to leave and that sort of thing and so that's that is a benefit but another thing that some of our a couple of our people who um, had been regularly attending just said online. Mm -mm. I spend all week in my job doing video conferencing and I'm not going to do it on the weekend. I'm not going to do it for something that's supposed to be, um, I guess, fulfilling. So I'm going to go for a walk instead and get some of those meaningful things in my life. Um, so that, that that is an issue. I do think that even though there are certain aspects of it that I think many of us would like to carry forward in whatever happens next and whenever that happens, there is a sense that it's not always gonna have to be like it is right now. And I think that um, we can be creative and do what we can because we don't know if it's gonna be three more months or three more years, frankly. 
and it's um, I I have realized partly in this conversation and preparing, thinking about things for tonight, that I do hold just a little bit there that we will get back to a certain amount of what we had before. I had a discussion with our Quaker meeting over the weekend um, after our worship saying, okay, I'm gonna be in this panel. What do you think about this? And so we had a discussion and people came up with, you know, 10 items that were so preferable to what we're doing, you know, of what we're doing now, what makes it great, all these benefits. But then the final count was, but we'd rather be in person. <laughs> you know, because of all those pieces of community that do come from being in a, in a shared physical space together. But I found that um, there, I mean, our group at best has 10 people and probably there are certainly weeks that have four or five. Uh, that number has stayed pretty much the same. Though the one thing that is different now, we used to meet every other week. After the very first time, people said, can we do this every week? People wanted to have, um, they didn't want two weeks to go by until we met again. And, and we're not a group that has other kinds of activities um, during the week. You know, we don't have anybody whose um, job it is to make the whole thing run, right? I mean, I'm kind of a convener of sorts, uh, primarily the contact person, but it's, we don't, we could have other activities. There've been times where we've done a, a little study group or whatever, but mostly when we come together for worship and whatever kind of discussion we have in conjunction with that, that's, that's what we have but their personal connections. And I think in terms of what you were saying with hospitality, because we don't have a physical building, even in the times we used to have where people could come to the door, come to your office or come to whatever, or uh, see you listed online and know where to come, what time, 10 o'clock on Sunday morning or something. I mean. We, we don't have that. The way people find us is by Googling, are there Quakers in St. John's? Or they'll do one of those um, quizzes online. What religion is right for me? And Quakers come up. And so then they say, well, how do I do that? And so then they Google, are there Quakers in St. John's? And who they find is me. And the hospitality happens before they show up for meeting for worship. It's the personal conversation that I have with them of, because it's tough to show up for a Quaker meeting for worship if you have no clue what's happening. The first time I went to one, I didn't know what was going on and it was over before I knew it had started. I kept waiting for it to start because it's all shared silence. So it's, it's different. It's important to have that conversation with people in advance. Um, because it will make them feel more comfortable. And that sense of comfort, having a clue what's going on, is um, part of that hospitality. Yeah, and you know, this is really interesting, Liz, because this is exactly why I wanted Liz to be a part of this conversation tonight, because she brings two really interesting perspectives. Uh, one that I hope we'll get into a bit later on is uh, her involvement with Out in Faith and her perspective as an LGBTQ person. But, um, you know, I keep saying to people, Quakers are the future for the church, especially the incarnation of Quakers here in St. John's. Because I think the days of a professional class of clergy are numbered. And what you will see is more small, intimate gatherings of people, uh, smaller, but more passionate because they're a part of a community that they really want to be a part of, right? And whether they found, you know, that community through doing a BuzzFeed, uh, you know, 
a quiz to, to figure out you should be an Anglican or you should be <laughs> Roman Catholic, whatever. That's a wonderful BuzzFeed evangelism. That's great. Um, but I, I think the nature of our communities are changing and will continue to change. So that's why I, I think Liz brings an interesting perspective. It gives us a glimpse in some ways into what, you know, the future of the church or, or all religious communities in some sense will be 10, 15, 20 years down, down the road. So that's a really, thank you, Liz, for, for sharing that, that perspective. I wanted to share one there of the- There are a lot of Quakers who'd be happy to hear that because, I mean, even though here in St. John's, we've stayed pretty consistent with our numbers over the 25 years I've lived here. Certainly on a global level, Quaker numbers are um, smaller than they had used to be, except in Kenya. Wow. Burgeoning Quaker community in Kenya. Interesting. Interesting. Yes. I just wanted to point out one of the um, opportunities that come with digital community, and it comes from Derek Shepard. He says technology allows the discussion to be uh, reviewed at a convenient time, right? So it gives you the option of being part of something live, but if that doesn't work, maybe you got little kids and they're going to bed around eight o'clock and you don't get a chance to tune in live, you can go back and, and, and check it out later on. And Derek is a part of a, a book study we're doing here at St. Mark's. Um, and we have people from outside of our parish, outside of our diocese, different parts of the province who are part of this. If I was doing that here in the building, I'd get the same, you know, dozen people who come to everything that we offer, but this, you know, gave us the opportunity to go a little bit wider. So um, I don't want to pick on people, but I'm going to pick on people right now. <laughs> when it, you know, when it comes to the opportunity, opportunities and challenges, the three of our panelists are really serving in some uh, unique situations and those people would be Liz, Steve and Paula. Paula because she's in a rural community, Steve because he's serving predominantly millennials. Is that a fair statement for me to make, Steve? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Liz and her involvement with the LGBTQ community. So in, for you guys, like what what are the unique challenges that you're seeing or the unique opportunities that you're seeing in your specific those communities where you are involved or serving? I think um, for us, what's been really cool is usually what happens with our, um, with our church around this time is most students are done for the summer. And so a lot of them, they're all over Canada or sometimes all over the world. And so they head back home for the summer. And so us being able to do things online with like a Sunday night live stream service or a Netflix watch party on a Wednesday night or a games night over zoom. Like it's allowed all of them to stay connected while they're home. Now, some of them, they were forced to their home in Embry or somewhere like that. And so they've been dying to get outside of Embry. Um, but so they're like really thankful for those kind of interactions. Right. And so that's been really cool for us. It's, helped us to really stay connected to those who are typically really distant from us right now. Um, and we don't typically see or a lot of times hear from them until the fall. And so that's been really cool for us. Um, some of the challenges is the biggest challenge for right now is we recognize that like our church, like if everybody showed up, there'd be a little bit over a hundred, but I mean, we all know there's probably what 18,000 students at Mun. So how do we engage and connect with the other 17,900 um, that aren't a part of our Mosaic community um, who aren't going to say, oh, on a random Sunday night, oh, I need to take in a live stream service tonight. So I'll check out Mosaic. Like, that just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So how do we connect with that group of people who aren't already connected? Because I still really believe, like, we're thankful for technology and we use it um, to the best of our ability with sponsorships through Facebook or Instagram campaigns and all these things. But I really believe like a personal invitation to something or like a one-on-one -on -one connection really wins the day still. And so how do we make that one-on-one -on -one connection with someone who we don't even know, we don't have the opportunity of bumping into the chemistry building anymore 
on a random Tuesday, or like, how do we do that now um, in this world where I think if I was even to send, if I got all the emails of all the students at Mun for some reason, they still probably wouldn't come if I got the email all 17,000 of them because it's not that personal. But if I could get face to face to them or a Zoom call or a phone call it might make it a little more personal, but that's just not attainable. So that's kind of the challenges we're in now is how do we connect with them? How do we share Jesus with them uh, when we just have no connection at all at this point? So, so here's what you do. <laughs> you, you create a bot, a Twitter bot. Yeah. You specifically target any Memorial University students. <laughs> you spam their news feed with a BuzzFeed quiz. You rig the quiz so that everybody gets the answer. The, you know, the faith community you're looking for or best suits you is Mosaic University yeah. Chapel. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then everybody just comes to you. Yep. True. True. I mean, that's in some ways, though, that's the dark side of digital technology. It's so easily manipulated by the people who know how to manipulate it because most people who are using a smartphone or you know social media or any kind of you know digital technology we don't understand it right. we just know that it works yeah. but there are a lot of people who know how it works and they know how to hook you through it right so there's a there's a dark side to yeah to it's it's a tricky line because like I could pay if I had all the money in the world, I could pay $5,000 to Instagram and they will make sure an ad that I create ends up in 2 million people's Instagram feeds and can target it towards 18 to 24 year olds who have searched posts about universities or church or campus and it ends up in their feed, which in my mind is like, that's awesome. But is that also very invasive, <laughs> right? Well, you could also pay a bit of extra, extra more money to employ a social media marketing person who can, you know, you know, create some kind of ad that will, you know, target people for specifically the things that they're looking for, right? And you can really, you know, and it, it's all around us. We're swimming in that all the time, yeah. right? You've all experienced, you talk about, you know, going to home hardware and buying some paint. And then all of a sudden there's a, home hardware ad pops up in your Facebook, you know, feed. So, I mean, it, it's out there, right? We're swimming in this all the time. And sometimes there's a reaction to, to that. People don't, don't want that, especially when it comes from, from faith communities. Right. So it's a, it's a balancing act, I think. Paula, I'd, well, love to I'd like to say too, that there's a certain amount of letting people know that, we exist, but we are not what each of us individually does in our communities. We're not right for everybody. Not everybody's looking for a Christian experience. Not everybody feels that that is lacking in their life. And there are people that already have a religion even though it's not our religion and so i just want to stay really conscious and aware that i think one of the reasons that organized churches are losing populations is because of of rigid belief structures and expectations about people's, what kind of language and beliefs and everything else they're comfortable with. They might love your community. I mean, there are times where I thought, wow, what a wonderful group of people. I'd love to go hang out with them. But frankly, what goes on in the shared worship there? Yeah. There's a reason I'm Quaker, where people are quiet. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for me to feel like I belong when I'm surrounded by all kinds of language that doesn't speak to my belief system. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in the, in the church, again, it's like I said earlier, one of our learnings 
in the church is that we don't have a m- monopoly on community. I don't even think we have a monopoly on God, but that's a, that's a topic for another uh, conversation. We don't have a monopoly on community and people are finding community in all kinds of places. Not everybody is, but a lot of people are, whether that's in a yoga studio or in a local coffee shop or, you know, out on a trail, part of the East Coast Trail or something, people are finding community and they're finding, they're finding spirituality. And in the church, we have been rather exclusive in our membership, which I hate that word, but that's the way we've treated church, right? It's, you need to have membership. So, and we have this pattern of belonging, right? You believe like us, you behave like us, then you can belong with us. And for a lot of people, that's really off-putting, right? Um, They want the belonging, (laughs) not necessarily the belief and the behavior. Now, they might get to those things, you know, if, if the belonging is made available to them. But we have to, I think we have to be more open to the idea that they might not and I'm a part of a church and Jonathan's a part of a church, the Anglican church. We don't agree on Jack, you know what, like, <laughs> but we're still a community. We still come together. We still, you know, pray and find our a commonality together. Right. Uh, so I really like to hear from Paula, about the particular challenges in rural uh, communities. So first off, I'm going to go to bat for Ambrie. I grew up in Lewisport. I was going to say that too. I was going to say (laughs) disclaimer to anybody who is watching from Embry. Those that are personal views of Steve Grimes (laughs) and not of the Open Table Collective. Personal views of one of my students. (laughs) I'm from Leading Tickle, so I mean, I I know. I feel you. Drive till you think you came to the end of the road and the end of the world and then keep driving. (laughs) So I minister to people who live in all those little places. I live in a little um, village of Merritt's Harbor. I think there's maybe 15 houses here and maybe 10 of them are occupied at the moment. It's the suburbs of the big city of Herring Neck. So, you know, I didn't want to live downtown Herring Neck because it was too busy. Uh, And um, so, again, I have those people who live here you know, at the end of the road all of the time. Uh, And already it's interesting because our church council, we've met every second uh, Sunday morning uh, for a a check-in meeting. We only usually meet every second um, month when we meet in person. Now we're meeting every second week and quite enjoying. And already now it's been said from our church council, uh, from our Monday night faith chat series group, already they've said it. You know, next winter, when we're back to church and doing things regular, but there's a snowstorm brewing, there's no need of any of us being on the road and trying to get to church, we can easily do things this way, right? So it's helped them to see. Now that saddens me on the flip side, because I'll never again get a snow Sunday, because now that they know I can hit Facebook Live from home and lead worship, forget getting off with church on any Sunday ever again, people, I hate to tell us. But anyway, Um, So it has created, you know, it's allowed me to have my um, group of teenage uh, youth group kids uh, who asked if we could meet separate from the younger members of that group uh, on Saturday nights, you know, and asked if we could meet in uh, regular days. We all live in scattered communities, right, you know, Um, and it's only like driving across town probably, but it's separate communities, you know, across rural roads and so on and you know in nooks and crannies and where weather systems are different and all those things um so it means that even now and in the future we realize that we can still be together when um, their busy lives mean that we may not be able to get together at the church on a saturday night with that group of kids because they're the kids who are gone off to the hockey tournaments and the whatever Um, but even if they're gone for a hockey tournament uh, we may still be able to squeeze in a zoom youth group meeting um, from the hotel room where they are at their hockey tournament and I think it's opened all of our eyes to the possibility of being able to do ministry you know um, in that way but as I say as I said before 
um, the rural piece, as I was saying uh, to the Zoom uh, page people here um, before, um, access to good internet is a huge um, issue. Uh, it's a justice issue. It truly is. I truly believe that. Um, and as you know, we said that if we as faith communities want to do something to, uh, you know, have something good come out of some of this, that maybe we should pool our energies and make sure that um, our governments know that um, it's necessity. And if you're going to be talking that, you know, we're going to live into a carbon emission reduced future and more people working remotely from home, whether COVID's still on the go or not, and more church communities being able to function differently um, without reliable, accessible, affordable internet and those things, we can talk all we want about how this is going to be really good for us if we if we don't have that um, as a ground pin for, for what we want to be about, right? And um, so rurally, that is a, a major issue because again, your choices as to how you can hook onto the internet are not what they are uh, in other places. You know, I get no cell service here in my house. I get enough to drain the battery out of my phone. Um, and and that's, it's just a brick. Maxwell Smart had better service on his shoe phone than I can get on this iPhone, right? Um, so cell service, right? And and internet accessibility is, a, is an issue and um, a big issue. Um, you know, our roads are gone. There's a lot of potholes and people were saying, we got to ask for pavement. And I'm like, truthfully, we really don't have anywhere to be right now. I'll put up with the potholes. I'd rather some better internet at the moment. <laughs> Right. And so so I think it is. And for if we're going to work together on something as faithful people, you know, I think of those kinds of issues that all of our voices um, asking for some of those things would be um, extremely important. So yeah. Um, it's yeah. Jump I just want uh, to Paula's point. There was a comment from um, Amber Tremblett, and she was referring to earlier when we were talking about uh, you know, privilege and the, some of the technological barriers. And uh, she says, kind of like what Paul is saying about becoming advocates, right? And um, she, she is talking about, you know, us becoming advocates for funding libraries, right? Where people can go and get public access to the internet, right? Uh, doing stuff like that. But even, you know, advocates for like when, you know, when, when all of this is over <laughs> and we go back to normal, whatever it is, to be aware of privilege all the time, right? That even when we gather together on Sunday, whether it's at St. Mark's or in somebody's home for a Quaker meeting or wherever at Mun, wherever it is, there's always going to be barriers that keep people away right and a lot of those things is it's no fault of the people who are kept away but we could do something about it as the privileged people right to be advocates for better public transit so that it's easier for people low-income people to get places maybe what's keeping some people away from church is they just can't get there they don't have a car and the bus system sucks on sunday right so it's just becoming the role of being an advocate, I think is really important. And maybe the question always needs to be, maybe community, and a shout out to Amber, because she's a Lewisport girl too, so. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Lewisport. Um, but maybe the question and maybe community is asking who's not here. Yes. As That's opposed to being question. excited about who is here, it's always asking ourselves who's not here and why aren't they here? And what can we do about that? I agree. I think Anne was saying that that's really the, the heart of hospitality is looking around the table and saying, who's not here? And how do we and how do we make room for them at the uh, yes. at the table? That's that's the, what I've, I I keep thinking about this through this whole conversation. Is, I mean, for me, the big piece about hospitality is about how do we it's not just about how do we make people feel welcome, because uh, that's something that we do to them. But how do we take away our barriers that we're putting up that are keeping them from feeling uh, from feeling welcome, um, and that's yeah, that's the that, that's the big piece. Yep. So, Liz, I'd like to hear now for about um, you know particular opportunities and challenges when it comes to the LGBTQ community because this may come as a shocker to some people on the panel or listening at home. We have not been great as a church 
when it comes to welcoming and accepting and loving our brothers and sisters, uh, people from the LGBTQ community. So Liz, what are the challenges and opportunities that you see when it comes for your community? I was, um, I didn't participate, I wasn't in the panel, but I um, listened to a panel just last week that was addressing the tremendous isolation of people in the 2S LGBTQ plus community during COVID. Um, and I think what I can do is talk about why some of those are specially unique to that community uh, and then perhaps out of it become come some ways that that faith communities can be helpful for um, people that are low income and part of the queer community they may be living with parents who themselves are not accepting of their kids' lives or for people that are trans or non-binary uh, whose families really previously had rejected them and didn't want them at home and now that's the only place that they can there's certainly plenty of people in the queer community, again, uh, marginalized income wise as well, who would be um, homeless or couch surf in the best of times. How do you couch surf in um, physical distancing and isolation? So those are, those are real concerns and the, when I talked about community at the beginning, I talked about a sense of belonging and acceptance. And I guess that's because for me, even in my situation where I've, you know, I've been out for more than 40 years, but I still go into a brand new group where I don't know people. And I perhaps don't know what my sense of welcome and belonging is and loving the idea of me or a member of my community is very different than people in the queer community feeling like the people around us have any clue what our lives are like because I don't think a whole lot about being queer at this point in my life, just because maybe I'm at a stage in my life, I just don't care what people think. Um, but it's also true that when you're part of a marginalized community, you view everything through that lens. And I think that's true of people of color, it's true of indigenous people, it's true of queer people, it's true of people on the uh, low end of the economic spectrum. And those of us um, that are privileged, at least in some of those categories, have no idea what it's like to look through that other lens. And it doesn't mean that everybody wants to talk about it or feels comfortable just putting themselves saying, well, this is what it's like. But it's, um, I guess it's like for me, if I wanna learn about racism, I need to do my homework, not just go up to people of color and say, teach me. And that's what it's like in the queer community as well. You know, there, there, 
there are a jillion resources that never used to exist that, that help people have a clue. So that sense of belonging and welcome and acceptance refers to a lot more than having a pride per flag on your building for one week out of the year. And that's a very meaningful statement. I'm not saying don't do that. That's a very, very meaningful thing. Um, but I can't, you know, by seeing things through the lens, just as a, a huge issue, but a simple thing to notice, I grew up in a, in a Protestant church up until that time I was um, 18. And, you know, the, all the pictures, and I've seen it in churches around town too. They'll have pictures of the members of their church and it's all family groups. It's all lovely heterosexual family groups. How safe would a queer family be having their picture right there? Like everywhere, it's like, introducing someone and, and this is their husband or this is their wife or whatever. And it's, there's just so much um, that's built into our communication system in the dominant society that is about heterosexuality and about cis people. And so it's, when you start seeing it through a different lens, you notice how it's there everywhere. So that's one thing I'll just, I guess. Yeah, Liz, thank you so much for that. That's again, super important for us to, to hear those things because yeah, heteronormativity is just how we see the world, right? In the same way as me as a, as a white straight male, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, you look up privilege in the dictionary or you Google it in Wikipedia. There's a picture of Rob Cook, <laughs> right? Um, so I, you know, I think a huge part of hospitality is making room for those voices, right? Those marginalized voices and recognizing, again, things that we just take for granted. I'll tell a story I told this to Liz when we talked on the phone a couple of days ago about, about this conversation. Uh, I was a part of the first Out in Faith panel conversation. Don't ask me why they asked me to be part of it, but I was there. And I remember, I, I, you know, somebody was talking about how hard it is for, <laughs> for, you know, gay and lesbian and trans people who are trying to find a faith community, you know, um, how do we know that your church is safe, that your faith community is safe for us, that you're affirming that we're, you know, we're, we're going to be welcomed when we walk in the door. And I very naively said, you know, oh, it's at St. Mark's, it doesn't matter. We just accept everybody. Right. And I mean, I got raked over the coals, like rightfully so too. Right. Because from my perspective, right why wouldn't anybody who just walks in through the door be welcomed, right? So I needed to have those, <laughs> those lenses ripped off my, my head to, to, to see like, not everybody experiences our community the way that we do, right? So making sure that there's space for everybody, the marginalized, the people who, you know, people of color, all these, and it's tough for us, it's tough. But I think, you know, important first step is just being aware of the place of privilege that we come from. And it's hard to shake, though, really hard to shake. It can be uncomfortable at first, right? You don't know what's the right terminology to use or, right? But I find people are generally very understanding about those <laughs> kinds of things and willing to work through them with you, right? Um, our time is is running it. So I wanted to leave with a, just a couple of um, 
questions, two questions I'll really throw into one. It's again, it's a free for all kind of thing. What's just, you know, some practical advice that you would give to anybody who is either watching this right now or going to watch it later on because through the miracle of the interwebs, this is going to be up now for the rest of your lives. They come back and haunt you. <laughs> um, what practical advice would you give to people, you know, who lead faith communities, who are part of faith communities? In particular, how can we be better? How can we be better as churches? Because I think it, to go back to something Anne said earlier, the opportunity that is presented to us now with digital communities, right? It's all, I kind of look at it as a, it's a do-over, right? Let's learn from the mistakes of the past because we haven't always been great when it comes to community and hospitality. What can we do now? What practical advice would you give to someone to how we can create better communities? I'm going to say one thing, and, and it's something I've discovered in the last couple of months. Um, there are things we can do better digitally than we could face to face. And I never would have thought, because I'm a firm believer in let's all get together in the group hug thing. And, you know, um, the face to face is really important to me. Uh, but I've been part of a number of different projects that came about as a desperate outreach of the Redemptorist community. So we're a branch of, we're a group within the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church and a religious community. And uh, one of the things we've done is um, a devotional thing uh, online. But what we did, what we never could do face to face, we drew people from all over the world as faith leaders for different days of this whole thing. We never could have done that face to face because we would have had our little group in St. John's. So I think the one piece of advice is like this has, has taken away boundaries, national boundaries and uh, all kinds of other boundaries that we may or may not have known were there. Like take advantage of the fact that some of these boundaries are gone and celebrate them and, and just experiment. Yeah. I would say don't don't assume that there's a one size fits all that nothing is going to work for for everybody. There are going to be people who are not going to get Zoom church. There are people who are not going to who are not going to be fed by online communities in the same way that they will face to face. And that's not because they're luddites and it's not because they're, you know, techno peasants or their technophobia or anything like that. Different people work in different ways. And I think that, you know, trying to assume that everyone is going to, you know, we're, we're all going to, you know, I, I, I was thinking about the, you know, the, the conversation about, um, you know, when Liz was talking about, uh, I mean, how do, how do we make room for people who already feel marginalized? without without making them think that we're being nice to you now so that you'll be more like us which is a terrible thing to do to anybody you know uh, in you know in in any time so how do we how do we respect that diversity of people around the uh, around the table we got to recognize that not everyone not everyone even necessarily wants to be at that same table so we got to have other tables as well yeah and especially yeah. because everybody is skeptical of us anyways because they think we're only being nice to them because we want them to come to church, right? So that's in itself a big barrier. Sorry, Paul, I cut you off there. Yeah, no, no, no. And, but I was just going to say on top of what Jonathan said then, you know, to always remember those we may be potentially leaving out or leaving behind. And so while I'm online, I'm thinking about the people who maybe are not online. When we're allowed to go back to doing what we were doing before, if that was tomorrow, and the government says you can unlock the door and go in and have your regular stuff like you always did in your in your building. I refuse now to leave behind the people who I've only had the privilege of being in community with because they've been digitally part of that. And so how do we figure out now how to live in two spaces? Right. My kind of joke is here in my congregation, we had two services every Sunday. So for 17 years almost, so at 11 and 7, same crowd. So in 18 years, I had preached 36 years worth of sermons because it was for the same people. Basically, a few different ones came in the morning and in the night. So it's been about a year ago since we um, went down to one service a Sunday and we've moved the time around a bit and so on. So I got a year with just one service a Sunday and God laughs 
because as soon as I'm back having a service in the sanctuary, Paula will still be doing something like I'm doing online now. And so I'll be back to two services a Sunday, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful thing, right? Um, so always be mindful of who, of who we may be leaving aside for whatever reason, for whatever reason, and how do we amalgamate and bring together both of those places mm -hmm. to make something wonderful and welcoming for everybody. Yeah, hybrid, yeah. hybrid. I think uh, I think I wouldn't limit the conversation or the thought process to yourself. Like bring other people to the table. We have a we have a lead team over our church. I think it's eight or nine of us, um, and it's amazing to watch them just take a little like mustard seed of an idea and make it like shine. Right. So I I was thinking the other day with them like how do we I don't know bring some of the things that people are nostalgic about of our like normal gatherings that we had. And from that, our hospitality coordinator said, well, why don't we drop off like snack packs to each person that goes to our church that lives in the city. And so, and from there, it just went on where we filled little brown bags with classic snacks that we'd have a part of our hospitality on Sunday night. And we got people to sign up. And so we dropped it off and they ate these snacks while they're taking in our stream on a Sunday night. Right. So, and I would never have come up with that on my own. And so to like to be able to do that in a round table where you're having the discussion together, I just think it, it, it helps appeal to more people or um, meet the, the people that you might not be necessarily thinking about all the time and spark some creativity that you never come up with on your own. So, yeah, one of the most powerful things any community, faith community or otherwise can say is what can we do to help? Hmm. Right. And just the power of listening. Right. Which I think, I think again, goes back to what Liz was saying about, you know, just being really serious about listening to other people's point of view and other perspective. And I think maybe, and, you know, as I was listening to Liz and then looking at some of the comments that are on the Facebook stream, I think maybe we're going to need to do a conversation that's just around privilege and marginalization and those kinds of things. Cause a couple of the comments there, people are, I think are, looking at the world a little like you know with through rose colored glasses um you know there there are people who are on the outside as much as we want to say everybody is welcome and included the reality is that it's it's not and we need to work harder and be better uh, at welcoming and accepting people and so i think maybe one of the other conversations we need to have is around those very things, right? And maybe even hearing from some people who would be from some of those communities, right? Listen to people of color, people from, uh, listen to, you know, immigrants and refugees and, and their experience of, of us. We might not like what we hear, <laughs> but we need to hear it, right? Uh, so I think uh, we'll, we'll end it there. Thank you so much to our panel for your sharing your, uh, I don't know if I'll call it expertise, but your experience and your thoughtfulness and, you know, giving us a glimpse into your own uh, personal lives, but also the lives of your communities. We really appreciate it. Thank you to everybody who uh, tuned in through Facebook Live and who will come back later on and watch this again. I would encourage our panelists afterwards to go back down through the comments and stuff. You may want to engage with people in some further conversation there. The conversation shouldn't just end uh, when we end this conversation, but it should go on. Uh, just to give you a heads up, there are some other conversations we've planned in the not too distant future. Uh, one of them is going to be around uh, community and liturgy or worship. And in particular, how we, you know, what that looks like in the digital age, um, you know, community and, and music. One of the things that people are really missing right now is the inability to sing together. And so, you know, we need to have a conversation about the, not only the importance of music, but like as this drags on, how do we find ways to, to, to sing together? And the other really important conversation that we feel we need to have is around, uh, youth ministry and children's ministry and what that might look like in in a digital age because again that's another conversation that's fraught with opportunity but also challenges so stay tuned there's going to be some other really interesting conversations where we're going to hear from other local leaders and and lay people 
uh, who have really interesting things to say. So thank you again. Uh, good night, everybody. And uh, peace be with you. Take care. Thanks, Rob. Thank you.